Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, March 28th, 2019. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brains. Today we have a variety of stories coming to us from the surface of the planet and the farthest systems, well, in our Milky Way, and a few systems beyond, but this isn't really a all the way out to the edge of the solar system kind of day. But that's okay. The science still is coming. And some of the science that is coming is the science of gravitational wave detection. They have been performing upgrades on the Virgo system and the LIGO system that in past years have allowed us to see the mergers of black holes and neutron stars. These upgrades that they have conducted are going to allow these systems, which will turn back on on April 1st, 2019, just a few days away, uh, these detectors will now be able to um, to have improved sensitivity that makes them two times more sensitive to the mergers of these compact objects. They are looking forward to a increase in volume of how much of the universe they're able to see merging objects within. Uh, that volume is going to increase by a factor of eight. Now with that increase in volume, uh, they also expect a increase in the number of mergers they will be detecting. So hopefully in the coming years, we're going to see more amazing results like we got a couple Augusts ago when we saw the merger of two different neutron stars, not just in gravitational waves, but also in a variety of colors of light, as well as in particle detections. We are really entering a multi-messenger era of astronomy. This means that when we detect objects nowadays, it's no longer just in the light they give off, the particles they send our way. We are now detecting things through gravity, through light, and through particles all at the same time. This gives us a much richer understanding of, or not necessarily understanding, a much richer set of observables that the theorists have to match their theories to. And when they get it right, it gives us a much richer understanding of what's going on within our universe. Now, this is just turning on April 1st, so who knows how long it will be before they go from detecting things to publishing things to sharing those things with the world. This is, after all, the um, slow, delayed gratification of science. Last time they turned these detectors on, it was almost instantaneous that they detected their first gravitational wave event, but it took time to publish everything. So stay tuned. At some point, we will have more detections to bring you, which will give us further understanding on things like, where did the gold you're wearing come from? Just a couple of years ago, I would have said supernovae, and I would have been wrong. We now know, because of this kind of science, that those kinds of metals actually come from the merger of neutron stars. Now, moving a little bit further out in our solar system, we have actually in another solar system, we are now able to, using optical interferometry, watch planets orbit distant stars. This is the HR8799 system. It has been observed to have a series of different gas giants within it, and using the Very Large Telescope and its interferometry capabilities, astronomers have now imaged at a scale where this bar in the image represents 20 astronomical units. So about, um, about a third of the way out to Pluto, uh, we are able to observe these stars going, the, these planets going round and round the star. Now this black splitch in the center, that's actually where they're blocking the light from the star from hitting the detector so that that light doesn't wash out the light that they're receiving from the planets. Um, this is a pretty amazing system and to quote from the press release, our observations suggest a ball of gas illuminated from the interior and this is referring to the innermost planet in this system. It is so warm that rays of warm light swirling through stormy patches of dark clouds are escaping out of the planet. Um, convection moves around the clouds of silicate and iron particles, which disintegrate and rain down into the interior. 
This paints a picture of dynamic atmosphere of a gas giant exoplanet at birth, undergoing complex physical and chemical processes. So what he's describing is the innermost planet in the system. This one right here that you can see going around is so close and so young that it's still radiating away the heat with which it formed while simultaneously getting irradiated by the star that it's right next to. And all of this heat factors to create storms of silicate and iron particles. It's raining metals, folks. It's raining metal. Moving on to a less destructive story, well, I guess a differently destructive story. This is a picture that is rapidly making its way across the internet because it is beautiful and poetically named. This is the Butterfly Nebula. This particular system is 1,400 light years away from our own solar system, and it is the home of ongoing star formation. These two bubbles that you see in this image, these two bubbles are actually uh, blown out by the radiation pressure of bright stars forming in this system. The system is very similar in age and distance uh, to the Orion Nebula, which folks in the Northern Hemisphere are used to observing. This system is actually 180 degrees around the sky. Now, this system, um, it's forming stars up to 10 times the mass of our sun. These are stars that are going to go supernova at some point in the cosmically not too distant future in the next few million years or so. For now, this is yet another place that we can look in the sky and study how star systems form, study how clusters of stars form. The stars that are embedded within this red hydrogen gas, those stars are still surrounded by cocoons of material that are hiding their forming planets from spying eyes. And um, it's just a beautiful system. And this is where baby stars come from. Now, in other news, continuing to journey outwards from our solar system, we have confirmation of a second galaxy that appears to have negligible amounts of dark matter. You may remember that several months ago, there was announcements that a galaxy had been discovered that appeared to not have dark matter within it. This particular system had globular clusters that orbited it around the galaxy at a rate that could be understood just by looking at the luminous gas and dust within that galaxy. This was the first time we had seen something like that. Up until that point, when we looked at galaxies, we saw motions in the outer system that required there to be invisible mass within the system driving the orbital velocities. That invisible matter, uh, has been blamed for the motions of galaxies within clusters as well, and seems to scale up and be scattered across the universe in patchy clumps, lumps, and clouds. We have seen it with the cosmos data forming filaments. Uh, it's, it's out there. We know dark matter is real. And the question has been, are there galaxies made purely of dark matter? And are their galaxies made of purely luminous matter? And what is the continuum of ratio between dark matter and luminous matter between these two extremes of systems? Now, we'd seen a wide diversity of systems with a lot of dark matter, with what appeared to be average amounts of dark matter, but the no dark matter was new. And when those first results came out, everyone was like, mm, it looks like you did everything right, but currently we have a sample size of one. And a sample size of one makes everyone uncomfortable. But now a second system, this, this system has been discovered. It is not too far away from the initial system that was found. So in the lower left is the first discovery, NGC 1052, otherwise known as DF2. In the upper right, we have the new system, NGC 1052-DF4. These two systems are located in the same area on the sky, and they're going to keep looking to see what else they can find as they continue to see, um, is it that there is this whole population of low luminosity galaxies out there that are also low dark matter clusters? 
it's always new to just discover that your universe is hiding things that you always wondered, are those out there? Well, now we can say, yes, yes, there are systems out there that appear to not have dark matter. And we now have a sample size of two, which is much more comfortable to deal with. So those are really today's top news stories. And I will now take your questions here on twitch.tv. If you are watching live, type things in and please remember to at CosmoQuestX so I can find your questions in the chat. If you are watching this after the fact over on YouTube, thank you for being here and please click that subscribe button. Subscriptions are free and really help boost our channel. And for those of you watching live, you can always catch us later if you miss an episode. Our episodes come out most Mondays through Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. And uh, then later in the day, upload times varying, everything will get transferred over. We are a production of CosmoQuest X. We uh, are your place to learn and do science. You can find out more at CosmoQuest.org. Um, beyond that, we are produced by the Planetary Science Institute, working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. We are a 501c3 based organization, and your contributions are tax deductible wherever the law allows. Thank you so much for your bits, for your donations, for your Patreon support. You are keeping the science flowing. If you've ever said to yourself, I think more money needs to go to science, this is your chance to put your wallet where your mouth is. And we're so glad to those of you who have already done so because, well, we're here because of you. Okay, that's it with the shilling for today. I'm now going to answer your questions. Um, looking over at the chat, trying to find my mouse first. Um... Let's see what we have. Okay. This is the awkward part where I scroll until I find the first question of the show. So Veronica Cure asked, how was the Butterfly Nebula imaged? Um, the Butterfly Nebula was actually, yes, it was a Hubble image. It uh, came out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and you can find out more on their website. Uh, it was a montage of a series of different images, actually. Uh, let me pull it, pull up the thing so I just make sure that I'm not inadvertently lying to you. Uh, sorry, I did lie to you. It was Spitzer. I had the wrong space telescope. So uh, this was an infrared image from NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope. The object's official name is Westerhout 40, and it's known casually as the Butterfly Nebula. Uh, so, so Larry Weird and Proud is asking, um, did you know that, um, did you, sorry, words out of order, lenticular galaxies can be poor in dark matter. Uh, so there's a lot of debate on which kinds of galaxies do and don't have dark matter. There have been various reports that dwarf spheroidal galaxies are super high in dark matter. Other reports that they're super low in dark matter. At this point, I think our sample sizes are biased and we don't have enough data to be able to very clearly say this kind of system structurally, when viewed in optical images, looks this way um, and has dark matter. This other kind of system doesn't have dark matter. I think we really need to sample more things. Uh, it's, it's kind of like saying... Uh, Blonde people are always tall when it turns out you're mostly looking at Scandinavians who drank lots of milk growing up. Um, we don't know what biases are in our current sample size, and we need to learn more. Uh, let's see what else is in here. So Paranor asks, with two low to zero dark matter galaxies in close proximity, does that suggest a dark matter low area of space? Again, I, I am reluctant to... to say that based on how little data we have. These are low luminosity systems, the kind of galaxy that we're only really starting to understand. Um, they're super hard to observe. And, and because they're super hard to observe, we haven't observed a lot of them. So stay tuned. When we have more data, I will feel more confident in answering your questions. Um, 
So uh, I'm being asked, for the animation of orbiting planets, what was the time scale for that? And let me pull that back up. Uh, the innermost planet has a orbital period. Um, I believe it's, I'm not going to say what I believe. I'm going to look is what I'm going to do. Hold on. Oh, man, I seem to have accidentally swept this image. Um, let me pull this up again. I believe it's an order of days. So according to the YouTube, um, these are seven images taken over seven years. Okay, that doesn't help. So the data comes from seven different years. It doesn't say, thank you so much, Veronica. Um, turn on the doggo. Yes, I know. I have a doggo right here now. Um, let me turn on the doggo camera so that you can see. Um, here, go get him. I have a very lethargic dog going to get Cheerios. He will wander into the camera at some point. There are two very, oh, I didn't throw the Cheerios far enough. Um, thank you. Okay, now, there we go. I threw the Cheerios far enough. Um, so these images were taken over seven, it says the footage consists of seven images of HR 8799 taken with the Keck telescope over seven years. The video ma was made by Jason Wang. Data was reduced by Christian Morose and the orbits were fit by Quinn Kinpaki. Um... Trying to figure out more. So VLTI instrumentation was what was used to reveal the details. Um, so the innermost planet HR 8799E is a super Jupiter, a world unlike any found in our solar system. This is both more massive and more and much younger than any planet orbiting the sun. Um, the planet is inhospitable. It has a hostile temperature of roughly 1,000 degrees centigrade. It's not telling me. I'm sorry. The data is not telling me. That's annoying. I can't answer your question. Um, I will drop in a link to the press conference or the press release so that folks can go looking for more information. Um, okay, let's see. Sorry for the lack of answer. Um, and welcome M. Sira from Wisconsin. Uh, so Stormer Joe asks, how come when they enlarge the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, they get better results. They shoot the protons around, but they can only travel at a certain speed, so the size of the tunnel should not matter. Um, are they enlarging the tunnel? I don't know if they're enlarging the tunnel. I know they're increasing the energy in the system. So they are making it so that they can accelerate things to higher energies, which means they will be going faster around the system. Um, that, that's their present goal with the Large Hadron Collider is to increase the energies at which things will be able to collide. I will need to look up more to find out if they're actually expanding the tunnels. Uh, they are building also new instrumentation and those new instruments will be capable of detecting things that weren't detected in the last round of experiments. Um, I'm sorry, I don't keep that kind of detailed information in my head all of the time. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, sorry, I hate not being able to answer questions. Uh, let me see what I can quickly find for you.
Are you talking about the future circular collider they're building at CERN, or are you talking about the improvements to the Large Hadron Collider? So there are plans to build a future circular collider that's going to be a much bigger circle. There are also plans to upgrade the Large Hadron Collider. Um, the Large Hadron Collider, they're just increasing the energies. Um, the future circular collider... Uh, is designed to have higher performance, but I don't know what that means. Um, I'll need to learn more about this, but here is a link that people can follow. Uh, so my answer was related to the Large Hadron Collider upgrades. Um, with a larger size, the, the basic uh, improvements that you can have with the larger size is you have a whole lot more magnets that you can string along to accelerate the particles to higher and higher energies. Um, it's also, there's precisions involved. Getting things going in a tight circle is harder than getting things going in a big circle. Um, but then it takes a lot more money to build something in a really big circle. Um, so more reading needs to be done. I will need to do more reading. Um, okay, do we have any more questions? Um, if not, I'm going to let you know there are uh, more space launches coming up in the coming days than you can shake a stick at. Uh, so please give this channel a follow and either myself or the uh, ever wonderful binary blaze Annie Wilson will be here and it'll probably be Annie she's really the one who knows her rackets uh, will be here to bring you those events live this channel in addition to bringing you the daily space most Mondays through Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern 10 a.m. Pacific which is currently but not always 5 p.m. London uh, we also have the Sunday science hour same time same place and we bring you lots of random goodness so give us a follow and get notified whenever we go live at twitch.tv slash CosmoQuestX. We are here to put science in your brains. Um, and you can keep the conversation going. Join our Discord and talk science and uh, join us for random games and goodness where we are kind of known to talk smack, talk science, and take each other's trains playing Ticket to Ride and other games. Um, we also invite you to help us explore. We will be launching software in the coming months to help find the rock that the OSIRIS-REx mission is going to bring back home to the planet Earth. So stay tuned. Uh, there is more to come, and it is you that is keeping this science flowing. So thank you so much for all your bits, all your donations, and for following us on patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. And that, I think, is all she wrote. Um, we are a production of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. And I am going to, in just a moment, run the credits. Um, and I am going to also find someone to raid who is another educational streamer so that we can keep the learning going. Our show is part of the Knowledge Fellowship. Uh, we are also part of Brainy Bites. So join us on either of those places and uh, we will help you connect with other streamers who, well, talk science and do science. We are going to stream, we are going to raid over to Obother in just a moment. He is a maker and always doing interesting things that I wish I had the time, energy, and hand-eye coordination to be able to do as well. So thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for bringing your questions, and thank you for bringing the community. Wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon, and get outside and look up. Bye-bye.